was nervous about starting preschool. Really, really nervous. I was already a little bit of an anxious child, but this transition just brought on a huge wave of separation anxiety. I was nervous about being away from my parents. I was nervous about the new adults and the new children and the new environment. So my parents had their work cut out for them when it came to preparing me for this big step. I'm sure they did many things to help me adjust. Lots of conversations, reading books about going to school for the first time, gentle reassurances. But I specifically remember two things that they did for me. First, they gave me this photo magnet. I clearly still have it. It usually lives on my fridge. It's a photo of me and my parents on a hike. I'm wearing orange shorts and a white bucket hat. Sort of wish that I still had this outfit in an adult size. I'm carrying a little child-sized walking stick. I'll put it in the back later in case you want to see just how adorable I was. I look really cute. <laughs> and I carried this photo with me in my backpack to preschool, and I kept it in my cubby so that I could hold it and look at it if I felt scared or sad or homesick. It was something of a transitional object for those of you who are familiar with psychology. This photo provided a tangible connection to my parents. It reminded me that I was loved and cared for even when my parents were not physically present. My parents also taught me a song. And here's where the story maybe gets a little bit embarrassing. I know this song by heart to this day. It's called, My Mommy Comes Back. And it goes like this. My mommy comes back. She always comes back. She always comes back to get me. My mommy comes back. She always comes back. She never would forget me. I know. It's kind of precious. It's kind of sad. <laughs> it's kind of sweet. And I, I have to admit, I feel this pit in my stomach when I sing it or when I think about it, because all of my sense memories of this song are sad and anxious. My body remembers little Sarah singing it with tears in her eyes in the car on the way to school. It must have broken my parents' heart and humming it to herself at snack time, like knowing, okay, it's only a few more hours before I get picked up. But I'm happy to report that the song worked. The photo worked. I made it through preschool. I made it through kindergarten and all of the transitions that followed. The song helped soothe my fears of being abandoned or left behind. It reminded me that my mom or my dad, my caregivers would come back for me. That I wasn't being thrown to be alone by myself forever in an uncertain world. This song came to mind this week, in part, of course, because today is Mother's Day. It's also my mom's birthday, and I see your square on Zoom, so happy birthday. We'll FaceTime later. <laughs> but the song also came to mind because that pit in my stomach, that separation anxiety that I experienced, it connects to the disciples in today's Gospel reading. 
This text falls in the period between resurrection and ascension that we've been living in for the past few weeks. Jesus has risen and he is once again with the disciples, but he's not sticking around. Today's scripture is part of what is known as the farewell discourse, Jesus' final words and messages before he ascends to heaven. I imagine the disciples were maybe feeling a little separation anxiety. So Jesus has his work cut out for him in preparing the disciples for this big step. Jesus doesn't give them a photo magnet or a song, but he does give them a promise. Jesus says, my beloved ones, I will not abandon you. I will not leave you alone, just like I have been your advocate, your teacher, your healer, your guiding light. God will send another advocate. This promise of Jesus, it's for the original disciples, the ones who have known and loved him in the flesh, but it's not limited to them. It's also for the next generation. His words speak to the first disciples, but they also speak to the ones who came after them, the actual recipients of John's gospel. The gospel of John was not compiled until a pretty good time after Jesus' ascension, so most of its original recipients had never met Jesus. We have that in common with them. We've never met Jesus in the flesh. So this promise is also for us. Generations and generations and generations and generations later. This advocate that is promised is our advocate. But who is she exactly? The advocate has many names in scripture. The Greek word paraclete, that's the Greek for advocate. The Hebrew word ruach, which means living breath. Another Greek word, pneuma, which means spirit. And the name Sophia, or wisdom. All of these names, these nouns, in their original languages have genders. In Greek and Hebrew, a noun is either considered masculine or feminine, or sometimes neutral, non-binary. And many of the terms used for the advocate, despite today's translation of the Gospel of John, are actually feminine or gender neutral. Numa, that's a neutral noun. Sophia is feminine. And so the advocate, Sophia, Numa, the Holy Spirit, both in scripture and in centuries of Christian theology is often talked about as the divine feminine. God is beyond our conceptions of gender, and all gender identities are encompassed in God, but the advocate is often talked about as showing us the feminine qualities of the divine. Some of these qualities are listed in today's text from the Wisdom of Solomon. Now, some of you may be wondering, Pastor Sarah, where is the wisdom of Solomon in the Bible? I'm not familiar with it. Well, that's because it isn't there exactly. You won't find the wisdom of Solomon in most Protestant Bibles because it's not part of our canon. The wisdom of Solomon is what is known as a deuterocanonical text. That means that some traditions consider it to be part of the Bible, while others do not. The wisdom of Solomon is in the canon of the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, but not the mainline Protestant Church. Our biblical canon was created through a series of choices. 
Religious leaders sat down again and again and again and again to debate and to decide what to put in and what to leave out. And I find it worthwhile to read some of these texts that were ultimately left out, partly because they offer different perspectives and insights, and also because the gospel writers, they were familiar with these texts. The author of the Gospel of John knew the wisdom of Solomon. And if you read the two side by side, this becomes very clear. There are similarities between these two texts. I like to think of them as these divine echoes that resonate between these writings. And I chose the wisdom of Solomon as a reading for today because it helps us get to know this advocate that has been promised to us. Listen again to some of these descriptors of the divine feminine. She is renewing, intelligent, unique, holy, distinct, irresistible, steadfast, free from anxiety. She is the breath of power. She prevails against all evil. That sounds like someone I want to know. That sounds like someone I'd like to have as an advocate, someone who will speak on my behalf, someone who is a guiding light in my life. So the wisdom of Solomon it gives us some of her qualities. But that's not all. The wisdom of Solomon also goes into depth about two important facets of the way that Sophia works in the world. The first is that the advocate has, with, has been with God since the beginning of time. We hear divine echoes of this in Proverbs chapter 8, in which the advocate herself speaks, saying, when God established the heavens, I was there. When God drew a circle on the face of the deep, when they made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, I was there. When God marked out the fountains of the earth, then I was beside them like a master builder. And I was daily God's delight, rejoicing before God always, rejoicing in God's inhabited world and delighting in the human race. The Holy Spirit joined with God in the act of creation, laboring, rejoicing, delighting, delighting in humankind. That's divine motherly love. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Four Loves, where he talks about the different sorts of love that we experience as humans in our lives. I'm quoting here from an author named Stephanie Murray. C.S. Lewis writes that unlike the bond between lovers or friends who often feel that they were made for each other, the love of a parent for a child is of a sort that can reconcile even the least compatible people. The motherly love of the advocate can reconcile even the least compatible people. Think about how profound that is for a moment. It's the kind of love that can reconcile us with our enemies. It's the kind of love that can reconcile our pettiest grievances with a spirit of abundance. It's the kind of love that can reconcile humans at our most crummy, hateful, violent, with a peace that passes all understanding and a grace that is beyond even what we can imagine. 
The advocate delighted in our borning cry and delights in us still, delights in us with a gaze of tender, stern when it needs to be, motherly love. The second thing that the wisdom of Solomon tells us about the advocate is that she is active. She is on the move. She's mobile. You can't hold her in or hold her down. Does that sound like any mothers you know? On the move? LaShawn, I'm looking at you. <laughs> so connecting with the advocate, it's not just a feeling or an idea. It's, it's those two. We can connect with the Holy Spirit as an idea. We're doing it right now, right? We're thinking about her. I'm talking about her as a theological concept. And we can connect with the advocate as a feeling. Maybe when we smell the blossoms on a tree or when we have that moment of inspiration when writing a paper, we can feel her at work on the wind. But it's not just that. We also can connect with her through active practice. We are with the advocate when we practice making wise decisions, prayerfully considering all the options and deciding the right course of action. We are with the advocate when we practice caring for the poor, when we practice seeing those people who are without housing or who are struggling as our siblings. We are with Sophia when we practice justice in our day-to-day -day lives. We are with her when we practice breathing, just noticing that breath that moves in and out, in and out, in and out. And so I challenge you to practice, to look at that list of qualities and to pick one and to practice it every day. Maybe it's noticing beauty in the world, that you're practicing noticing beauty. Maybe it's loving your neighbor and you are practicing it each and every day. Because as we practice, we connect with the fact that the advocate is always with us. Because remember, in the end, that's the promise that Jesus made to us that the Holy Spirit is always with us. Always. She is with us even when we are at our most disconnected, even when we are at our lowest, even when we are at our most anxious, like the disciples were in this time of transition. My friends, the advocate reminds us that we are loved and cared for even when Jesus is not physically present. The advocate always comes back. She always comes back. She always comes back to get you. The advocate comes back. She always comes back. She will never, ever forget you. Amen.